tomorrow. A little bit off here, Wendell. I'm sorry. Joanne's sister in law, sister in law, Marge Visser. I th- Diane, I thought your voice was the voice inside of my head. That's how the same wavelength you and I are on. Anything you'd like us to lift before God? You're both traveling tomorrow. It's a mom party tomorrow. Well, we will certainly pray for the moms tomorrow as you ladies travel. Jacqueline. Indeed. And we're excited to celebrate her birthday this week. Oh, we got a birthday this week? <laughs> Eight? Eight years old? You're going to be three! <laughs> three is a good one. Um, and as a reflect, we um, are trying to figure out the week to do radiation, the week of the radiation, and we had our first meeting with Mayo via Zoom on Friday. Understood. Just pop by. Understood. Well, we're praising God. The, the week went well for Eliza. Going to be three this coming week. And then also, they're trying to figure out whether she's going to be needing radiation or not. And the consult they had was, didn't leave it as clear as they would immediately have liked. I feel like I'm telling the people who could were right within earshot that thing. <laughs> Jeffrey. Thankful for how well Linda's doing and just pray for continued healing. Indeed. Yeah, in worship bright and early this morning. Man. She beat me here. Did he get that off? Yes. Nice. Indeed. Kerm got that neck brace off and thinking about patients as he adjusted that. Um, having talked to Brenda, just being in there so long, the muscles aren't as strong and that's obviously a pretty delicate thing. So you want to keep that as upright as you can. So we'll pray for Kerm. Anybody else? All right, the parenting conference went well. Thankful it happened. Thankful it's done. So, All right, let's go together to our God in prayer. Father, we come before you knowing that you are, you say it a lot, but you're in charge of all things. We'd probably all be a lot more content if we, we really own that. And that's hard. I ask that you'd help us. Father, we pray, thinking about you being in charge of all things, we think about the, the choose moms. And Father, I ask that you'd bless them as they travel this week. That's, that's big stuff. Father, we thank you that they could spend this time together and they could travel together as, as well at the same time. Thank you for family and for the gift of being able to be together with loved ones. Father, as we think about that, we pray for Joanne Caswell with the, the loss of her sister-in-law, Marge. And Father, that's not easy at all. Think about my own in-laws and Father, you get to know them year after year, have experiences together. And Father, yet another reminder that this, this life is not forever. Father, we 
thinking about these bodies that are often frail and in need of mending, we pray for Kerm. Father, we thank you he's able to get the neck brace off, but we do ask that he would have patience as he adjusts and as his neck strengthens. Father, we thank you for the, the patience you've given him to this point. That's a, that's, a, that's a hard surgery, and that's a, a hard part to have of your body that's hurt. Father, we pray for, for Linda. She's going to be undergoing therapy for her shoulder. And Father, that entails a fair bit of pain. We ask that you'd give her perseverance, that you'd give, us, give her endurance, help her to, to muscle through. And Father, we... Thank you for a wonderful week for Eliza, and Father, we think about the, the joy of the week ahead. Thank you for birthdays, Father, they're enjoyable at, at all ages, but particularly when we're young, and particularly when we celebrate with those who are young. And three is pretty special. Father, we ask that you would continue to, to bless her. And Father, we pray for the new endorps, give them wisdom in regards to radiation treatment. Father, we ask that you would show them the different variables that would tip it in one way or the other and give them peace with the, the decision that they make. Father, we don't want to be those who, who revisit decisions over and over again, but Father, we might ask that we be those who trust knowing that you are the one who is in charge. And Father, as we think about you charting our course. We thank you for your work in the parenting conference over the, the weekend. Father, we ask that what it is that we studied and, and taught would be blessed upon to this number of families. And Father, there's a, a lot of parents going through quite a number of difficult situations. And give them wisdom. We pray the same for, for us with our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen going to be standing together in preparation for hearing God's word, singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. You're going to see that with David if you open your Bible to 1 Samuel 21, that Jesus loves David. And this is one of the instances where you put yourself in David's shoes in a more particular way. We get to stand for this one because it is a shorter passage. First Samuel 21. David went to Nob, 
to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? And David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king charged me with a certain matter and said to me, No one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. As for my men, I've told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have in hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves with, from women. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us, as usual, whenever I set out. The men's things are holy, even on missions that are not holy. How much more today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread except the bread of the presence that had been moved from before the, removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there on that day detained before the Lord. He was Doeg, the Edomite, Saul's head shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, Don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's business was urgent. The priest replied, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Allah, is here. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no sword here but that one. David said, There's none like it. Give it to me. That day David fled from before Saul. The day David fled from Saul, went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. David took these words to heart. He was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence, and while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gates and letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, Look at the man, he's insane! Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you bring me this fellow here to carry on like that in front of me? Must that man come into my house? Pretty much just kind of preaches itself, huh? Well, let's go to our God in prayer. And Father, as we come before you, we've got a very strange, strange passage, but our lives are often very, very strange. Each of us can point to circumstances in our lives that when we tell other people, they, they think, you're, you're pulling my leg. And Father, that's a bit of what we see before us this evening. But we ask that we might see you in the midst of this mess. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And please be seated. A few Christmases ago, I made the, the girls a dollhouse. If you could please pull up that slide. This is a rough, very rough blueprint. All right, so Gerald, don't get excited when you see that, okay? Don't be thinking about that during the whole sermon, saying, you know what, I'm going to be able to whip that up. I put it together in the study here at church. Two reasons. One is I would put it together after the kids went to bed. That way nobody would find it. So I'd put it together there. Number two, I didn't want to hear anybody hear my howling of frustration because you try to put those things together and they do not fit. They, they might fit for you, Gerald, but for me, they do not fit in the least. But you look at those instructions, it looks simple, doesn't it? It looks really, really, really straightforward. Not the case, though, when I tried to put it together. Usually things that, that look very simple and straightforward on paper aren't, aren't always that way in, in real life. Uh, the same goes for, for dating. Uh, in high school, I was friends with, and I, I don't know, I was one, glad we were friends, but this incredibly cool kid, his name was Dirk. He was like Will Smith, if you're my age, only he was white. That was, he was like the white Will Smith before all the trouble. That's kind of what he was like. And I would ask him once in a while for, for dating advice, because, I mean, he's, he's Dirk. And all his advice works really, really well if you're Dirk. You know, you'd be confident. Right? You'd you be yourself. That works really well if you're Dirk. If you happen to be Adam, your, your hands just, they, they sweat. They sweat like you're like a toad is kind of what they do when you're walking up to somebody and then you kind of just, and you just kind of turn around. Right? Be yourself. Really, really straightforward. When Dirk says it. But when you try to do it, it's kind of messy. 
And certain parts of the Bible are like that blueprint. Very, very straightforward. Things like, you shall not murder. You shall not steal. Things like, this man is blessed, this sort of man is not blessed. Very, very simple, very, very straightforward. Certain parts of the Bible are about as simple and straightforward as me trying to put together that dollhouse. And they're both in the Bible. The, the commands, Proverbs, these are, very, these are included to say, that you know what, that there, there, is this, there is something about black and white in life. And all the narrative parts are there to show you, but it's actually really, really messy. And think about your own life. Pretty messy, isn't it? And that's how it goes. And we see this mess tonight, and we see that, that God's at work even in this mess. And that's the claim of this sermon. God's at work even in the mess. The first mess we see is David, who's go, who goes to Nab. Uh, David, he's now on the run from Saul, and his movements are going to seem really, really erratic. It's like, okay, well, why, why are you going here? Why, why are you going there? He doesn't actually know, because he's not trying to go anywhere. He's just trying to get away from somewhere. You can think about times in your, in your own life where you don't really have a destination, anything you're shooting toward. You're just trying to get away from something in your life, right? And you kind of go here and there and here and there. You don't really have a goal. You're just trying to get away from something. That, that's David. He's just trying to get away from Saul. And so David's first stop is Nob. That's about two miles from his hideout at Naioth. And he stops to see Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech is not all that excited to see him. Verse 1 says that he trembled when he recognized David. They're the exact same words we saw when Samuel shows up to anoint David. All the elders tremble. They're like, okay, well, what, what are you doing here? What do you want? Same with David. Why, why are you here? And he's very curious. Why are you alone? Ahimelech wants David to explain, well, why, why are you the king's bodyguard? Why are you here by yourself? And David lies. Well, we don't know why. Or maybe David doesn't even know why. You could probably look back to times in your life when you lied. And in the moment, you didn't even know why you did it. You could look back and try to figure out why you did it. Well, that, that's what's going on here for David, perhaps. Or perhaps he thinks that Ahimelech is actually in league with Saul. Or maybe he's just trying to give Ahimelech some sort of cover. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on a king's errand. Tell, tell him that I'm here with Saul in case Saul asks. Maybe in the moment they're both terrified of Saul and they don't want to open up to each other about it. We got no idea. We just know David lies. He tells the priest, the king has charged me with a certain matter and he said to me, no one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. You read the, the commentaries and it's very interesting. A number of commentaries bend over backwards to try to say some weird way David's telling the truth. Well, why can't we just say that somebody in the Bible didn't do things perfect? Why can't we just say that David messes up? Why can't we say that he lies through his teeth here? Everybody in the Bible other than Jesus is a very, very mixed bag. I'm a very, very mixed bag. You're a very, very mixed bag. Jesus is the, he's the only one who's, who's perfect and you don't want to put that weight on David's shoulders. You don't want to put that weight on your shoulders. You're not going to be able to bear it. The Bible is really quite unique in the, the books of the ancient world in which it shows you all the, the failures of its heroes. Most likely Peter was involved with writing Mark and what Peter, what Mark, you read Mark through, Peter seems like he never knows what's going on. Is that how you would tell a story about yourself? That when Jesus works in you, that's how you tell stories about yourself. I don't have it all together. David doesn't have it all together. David lies. Lies about why he's there. Now, it, it, we don't know if he tells the, the truth about having any friends with him. Some people think he does. Some people think he doesn't. 
but he asks for food in a group. He says, what, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. This is not an unusual request. If you've ever stopped by the healing room or dropped off food there at the food pantry or brought food here to go to the food pantry, that's a lot of what the priests would do. That's kind of where you go to your food pantry. It's where you, uh, you pick up your various needs and if you don't have other resources. Nob's food pantry happens to be empty. The priest tells David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there's some consecrated bread here. Now, this is, if you, uh, if you ever learned about all the different temple furniture, this is what's called the, the bread of the presence or the show bread. There was 12 loaves, so one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it seems the idea is this is kind of your daily bread, kind of a gift of back to God for your daily bread, just like we give our tithes and our offerings. This is kind of a sign that everything we have comes from you, God. And that they baked new, new loaves every Sabbath. And then they took the other ones away, and only the priests could eat them. This is different from, from our communion bread. I'm not sure if we have every, anybody here this evening who's on the, the, the Lord's Supper Committee or the Communion Setup Committee. We don't have, my understanding, we don't have like a sacred box that we put it in to keep it, keep it forever. It's just bread. A lot of that bread winds up in casseroles. A lot of that bread winds up being fed to, to ducks. It's not holy bread. This was holy bread. Only the priests could eat it. But they could only eat it if there's real need. Well, the ceremonial regulations, they could be set aside if there was genuine need. So thinking about um, the Sabbath, let's say that you came across an ox in a ditch or your neighbor's ox in a ditch. You didn't have to feel bad about working up a sweat on the Sabbath day because you're helping somebody out. Say you came across somebody who's hungry. The priest could say, yeah, this bread that's only for us, you can eat it. So Jesus, he looks back on this very event and he applauds Ahimelech for, for giving this bread. It, it's what leads him to say the Sabbath is for man, not man for the Sabbath. And you can say the same about every one of God's commands and words. They're for people. They're pro-people. They're pro-you. When they become something anti-human, as if the, that they're restrictive, and they dehumanize you. Something's gone wrong with it. So Himelech, he's happy to help David out. But he makes sure that David's companions were ceremonially clean for ceremonial bread. This is why he says, have you kept yourself from women? And here's another thing where it seems like David's probably lying through his teeth. Because he says, we got this secret mission and we had to leave right away because we don't have time to get food, we don't have time to get weapons, but we certainly had time to keep ourselves away from women for a few days. Right? He's just kind of making it up as he goes here. But we do know that David kept his men from, from women. If you remember the story of David and Bathsheba, Uriah comes home, David tries to get him drunk, tries to get him to go home to his wife. And Uriah, even though he's drunk, he refuses because he says, no, 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 we're fighting, I'm not supposed to do that. It's a set of like you're totally on mission. So that's what David says when, yeah, my guys are out totally on mission. So he's, possibly, he's, probably, he's lying here, but these lies have consequences. You look at verse 7. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's head shepherd. Now you read through it and you're like, what the world is this going on? Anytime you read through the Bible and you see something where you say, I have no idea why that's there, it's really, 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 really important. It's worth paying attention to. Doeg's going to show up in the next chapter and he's going to fill Saul and, hey, you, know, you know who I saw? I saw David. And then Saul's going to come and he's going to kill Ahimelech. He's going to kill all the priests. He's going to kill their families. He's going to kill their children. So he just happens to be there. Maybe you've used the, the phrase God thing. It's a God thing. And I've used that uh, a few years ago, Bethany and Hudson. Kids, kids under two fly free. So um, Bethany would go visit a, a friend in, in one of the Carolinas. 
whenever our kids were, were under two because kids fly free, so you're just kind of taking advantage of that as best you can. If you're, if you're Dutch, you really want to take advantage of those deals, even if you don't want to go. So Hudson and Bethany are coming back, and me and the other kids are driving up. And as we're driving, a, a car crosses the median, comes within inches of us. So we're going 60 miles an hour. A car's coming about 60 miles an hour, literal inches. So my hand's just... Apparently, it's a big sermon with hands sweating, but my hands stopped sweating about the time Bethany showed up on, with, with the plane. But I, I thought that that's a God thing. Just missed by a couple inches. But okay, what about that car that totally loses control? Is, is that a God thing? That's a God thing too, right? They're all, they're all God things. So Doeg being there is a God thing. But what you don't want to take away from this is the fact that somehow Ahimelech's done something wrong because he gets killed. We tend to have, and I imagine you tend to have, I struggle with this too, very simplistic things in our mind. If I do one good thing, something good should happen. Did you ever have it where you do something good and something bad happens? You're trying to do something nice for somebody and for whatever reason you're getting in fights with them? Why would we expect that doing one good thing would always lead to, to a good consequence? It's just, that's not how it works. Life's not that easy. And here the Bible's showing you, life, life doesn't always go as smoothly as you'd like to think. It's pretty messy. So as we got David here at Nob in this big mess, Priest about to get killed. The fact that Doeg happens to, to be here, it's a sign that the, the Lord is working in strange ways. But also think about David, and what does he get here? Not only lies, but what does he wind up with? He winds up with bread, and he winds up with a sword. Winds up with his daily bread. Dale Ralph Davis says, well, why in the world would he get that? He does something wrong. And he makes a very fascinating point. He's right. Why do you get your daily bread? Is it because you do everything right all the time? Is that why God cares for you every day? Is because you do everything right? It's not how it works at all. So that, that's, that's David at Nob. It's, it's, it's a mess. He lies. God still cares for him. You sin. God still cares for you. Now we're going to see him at Gath, and this one is the, the, the really interesting one, David at Gath. David decides to go into Philistine territory, as in the Philistines who he's famous for killing. And he says, you know what, I've got Goliath's sword, and he winds up in Goliath's hometown. That's like the absolute worst place to show up. And the people recognize him, and then they, they, they remember that song that the people sang about him. David's killed his thousands. I mean, Saul's killed his thousands. David is tens of thousands, as is tens of thousands of us. That's not good news for David. He winds up in their hands. This is, uh, it's a bit like, think, think about Osama bin Laden. It's been 11 years since he was, he was killed in a raid in Pakistan. Imagine that a Navy SEAL is on that raid and he gets cut off from his group presumed dead. And he wakes up and there's Osama bin Laden's number two standing over him. That's the situation David's in. It's not good. So here what you have is you got God's chosen one in enemy hands. This is not what you would expect. You see the same with Jesus when he's arrested. It's not what you expect. There's a lot of things that happen to God's chosen people that are not what you expect. And David, for his part, he's terrified. He's very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath, that the text tells us. And David, he's not a man given to fear. He's not afraid to fight Goliath. He's not afraid when Saul throws two spears at him. But he's quite afraid right now. And you see in what he does, this is a Hail Mary play. It says he pretended to be insane in their presence. While he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors and gates and letting saliva run down his beard. 
So his plan is to convince them that he's crazy. Now, there's deceit in this. This is another lie, but David's not at fault here. David's at war with the Philistines. So that they have every reason to expect truth out of David as Ukrainians have to expect Putin to, to email them his attack plans. This is like Samson. The kids learned about Samson last week when he says, could you put my hands on the pillars? Right? He's not faulted for, for, for that lie. I just, he says, I just want to rest. No, he's deceiving his enemy. It's the same thing that, that God does with, with his people when he says, how about you split your people into two camps and some of you fight here and the rest of you come from behind and get in the city. Right? God's not faulted for, for making a, up a plan there. This is, is what David's doing. And David's trying to convince him that he's, he's crazy and he's already halfway there because what are you doing in Goliath's hometown with Goliath's sword? And so what he does is he marks up all the walls like kind of with his nails like graffiti and then what he does is he lets saliva run down his beard. We got... We've got a few beards here. Beards are making a comeback. I see Caleb's got a, Caleb's got a nice beard back there. Beards are making a big comeback. Um, Tim, that's, that's kind of like the, that's like the standard, that's like the standard beard, beard is the, the Tim Chu beard in my mind. That's kind of what I shoot for, and here's how far I'm getting. But beards in that culture was like a sign of honor. So to let spit and saliva run down your beard, this was just a sign of utter derangement. It's just not done. I mean, the equivalent of us would be like, say, I imagine a girl in high school who just really, really enjoys going to the bathroom in her pants just for fun. Her friends would be wondering, what in the world? Why would you do that? That's what, David, that's what these guys are wondering with David. Why would you do that? What's, what's wrong? That's what David wants. He wants them to think he's totally out of his mind. That's the only way he sees out of this. Now, the king of Gath's response, this is probably my favorite character interaction in, in all of the book of First and Second Samuel because I find him, he, the guy's just trying to do his job. I find this so funny. Achish says to his servants, look at him. Look at the man. He's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so sort of madman that you have to bring this fellow to carry on like this in front of me? Does he need to come into my house? Basically, he's saying, we got enough crazy here of our own. We don't need to borrow any from anybody. The guy's just trying to do his job, and he's like, this is what you're bringing me? So they kick David out of town. Now, this, this, is, this is a close shave, and what David doesn't say is, man, barely made it. He chalks this up to the Lord. Psalm 34 is a psalm about this. It starts off with a heading of David when he pretended to be insane before the king who drove him away. Thinking about this close shave, he says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. I'll extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. David thinks back to himself running around with drool coming down his beard. And he says, God's always with me. That's what he thinks. Imagine you got your own things that you can look back on and say, you know, God is always with me. In the moment, I would not have guessed this is actually what, what was God was up to, but God's with me. Notice his focus. He, he doesn't say, if God was with me, those Philistines never would have recognized me. He, he doesn't say, if God was with me, I never would have needed to, to leave Saul's palace in the first place. He doesn't say, you know, if God was with me, I'd still be safe at home in bed in Bethlehem. He, he doesn't doubt God's plan. He praises him for the little bits of it he can see. That's a sensible way to move forward in this life that isn't simple. It's not as simple as the directions would lead you to believe. And that's your life too. Not as simple as the directions would lead you to believe. But you trust God in it. Amen. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, come before you knowing that you are the one that we need to trust and that you lead and you guide. We see this with David. We see it in our own lives as well. 
We ask that we would have clear vision of it. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Going to, to stand together to sing four verses of He Leadeth Me. Yeah, hung on a little bit too long with that note there. Uh, let's go to our God in prayer for Focus on the Family. And Father, we do thank you for the work of Focus on the Family. I'm sure a number of us can think back to different things that we saw, different things we read from Focus on the Family. I think of being a little kid and watching McGee and me. And Father, we think about the work that they continue to do in the lives of families. We ask that you'd strengthen the, the families of this congregation, of this community. Father, we pray for, for, for good health in this community in that regard. We ask that you be with us throughout the rest of this evening. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. After God's parting blessing, blessing we're going to sing together four verses of my Jesus, I love thee. Go with uh, the blessing from Revelation. Now to him who loves us and freed us, made us to be a kingdom of priest to serve his God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.